Well, um, let's get started. So, welcome everyone to today's event, Aggression, War Crimes, Ethics, and the War in Ukraine. I'm David DeCoste, the Director of Religious and Catholic Ethics at the Markle Center for Applied Ethics here at Santa Clara University. This event is co-sponsored by the Ethics Center and the Santa Clara University School of Law. We welcome all those here with us in Santa Clara and all those tuning in online. The war in Ukraine has left us with many searing images, but few have been as powerful as video of bound civilian bodies with bullets in the back of the head sprawled on the streets of Bucha, Ukraine. Even in war, there are crimes that go beyond the violence we regrettably know and lament. Today, we are here to talk about such crimes, how the United States government is and should respond to them, and related ethical issues. There are the videos from Bucha and reports of Ukrainian children taken from families and sent to Russia, and nightly scenes of missile attacks on civilian power grids, and even the matter of the Russian invasion itself as a possible crime of aggression. We are so grateful today to have a superb panel to discuss these issues. Indeed, we are grateful and moved to have with us Ambassador Beth von Stock, the Ambassador at Large for Global Criminal Justice at the United States Department of State. Ambassador von Skok is surely well known to many from her frequent appearances these days on television and in newspapers, but she is especially well known to us as a beloved former professor and colleague at the Santa Clara University School of Law. I could go on listing her many outstanding professional achievements at the highest levels in the field of human rights, all these before taking on this remarkably challenging role she now has. But I'll limit those remarks of her achievements to this. While at Santa Clara, she was indeed a beloved professor and was instrumental in helping us establish our summer abroad programs on human rights and international criminal law, and also in helping to start the International Human Rights Clinic. We miss her here, and I know I speak for many when I say we send all of our support to her for the very challenging and important work she does. We are also today joined by David Sloss, the Sutro Professor of Law at Santa Clara and an expert on international law related to the use of force. An author of numerous books, Professor Sloss has for many years been a great supporter of the work of the Ethics Center, for which we're very grateful for the past support and for his appearance today. To those here and online, we'll have plenty of time for questions today. So if you're in the room, please take a look at that index card in front of you and write a question down and get it to the aisle and we'll collect them um, and pose them here. If you're online, please also pose your questions in the chat and uh, we will try to get to as many of those as we can. All right, so we'll get started and I thought I'd start the questions off a little bit by asking Ambassador Hunscock if she could describe to us her work yeah, what do you do? And, um, and we'll start there. Great. Well, thanks, everyone, for joining. Thank you for inviting me, and, and to Dean Kaufman, thank you for having me back at the law school. I had only um, conceptualized this building when I was on faculty member. I was on the building committee, and we were working with architects to think about what a new building would look like for the law school. It's so amazing to see it now being used to such great effect, and it's great to be back. Um, so I am the sixth U.S. Ambassador at Large for Global Criminal Justice. This is a position that was established by Madeleine Albright when she was Secretary of State. And at that time, it was the mid-90s, war had broken out in Europe, there was a genocide in Rwanda, and she had the idea of having an office that would be dedicated to these issues. It was partially inspired by the fact that the Security Council had, for the first time, created a standalone international tribunal to deal with crimes in the former Yugoslavia. And then when the genocide broke out in Rwanda, a parallel tribunal was established. They shared an office of the prosecutor and they shared an appellate chamber in order to be able to harmonize jurisprudence. And Madeleine Albright wanted there to be a point of contact within the State Department to support those two efforts. 
Um, the office has grown over the years. We now um, advise the Secretary of State and a whole range of interagency actors, including DOD, the White House, et cetera, on a whole range of issues involving atrocities prevention and response. And so that includes states that are going through transitional justice processes um, that we're seeing around the world, for example, in Ethiopia, raising the question of transitional justice after the war in Tigray, or the Gambia, emerging from a situation of authoritarianism under the Gambia regime. Um, so we would advise the embassies, for example, on how to approach the transitional justice system, how could we be supportive of it, et cetera. I also have a little bit of programming money. I get about $10 million a year that I can put towards supporting efforts around justice and accountability. So that's essentially my portfolio. And it was an enormous portfolio on February 23rd, 2022. And it became a crushing portfolio on you know, February 24th, 2022, when, when Russia reinvaded or relaunched a full-scale invasion of Ukraine. We have to remember they'd already invaded Ukraine back in 2014 and occupied Crimea and were controlling parts of the, the East, and the Donbass, etc. Um, but this was a more limited engagement. Now, after February 24th, it became a full-scale na nationwide um, uh, invasion. And so our office has been running point on the justice and accountability issues posed by Russia's actions. Um, Ambassador Francois, could you also comment on, and you mentioned you've been to Ukraine uh, a couple of times, yep. and just tell us um, about those trips, what you've seen and, um, in terms of war crimes and other matters. Yeah, so the first time I went, we basically just went across the border. The war was in full swing, and so there was concern about going too deep into the country, not only for our <laughs> personal safety, which I think was an issue, but also our embassy was down to a very minimal staff because most of the embassy staff had been one of the biggest embassies in the region. Most of them had been evacuated and they had set up an embassy in exile in Zhezhov, Poland, which is right across the border. So that was our deep um, point of departure. Um, I was traveling with the Attorney General at the time. We went in, we crossed the border, we met with Ukraine's then Prosecutor General, a woman named Marina Benedictova, in order to express our support for her work. The Attorney General also announced the creation of a war crimes accountability team, which was going to be in his Human Rights and Special Prosecutions Unit that would be singularly focused on investigating war crimes with some kind of a nexus to the United States. And so he was there to announce that and to start to establish a partnership with the Prosecutor General's office. Meanwhile, I had been funding in my office, um, well, I wasn't there yet, but my office had been funding a relatively modest project with the Prosecutor General to look at how to prosecute war crimes that had been committed in connection with the original invasion back in 2014. So we had some experts on the ground that were already working with the Prosecutor General. And so I was there to announce that we were significantly scaling up this effort. And so I have now been able to put a full $10 million of different money, not my normal money, but I got, new, I got a new um, grant uh, appropriation from Congress to do this. I was just there last week. The Prosecutor General hosted an enormous accountability-focused um, event. A number of states attended at the head of state level. Um, the Attorney General and I, again, attended together. Um, there were several panels and working groups on sort of mapping the, uh, almost like a stock-taking exercise, what have we done to date on the justice and accountability front, what gaps exist, and how can states better coordinate to fill those gaps to ensure what the Ukrainians are, are describing as multifaceted accountability. They want accountability at, on all fronts for all international crimes that are being committed there. And so we were there to attend that. President Zelensky attended as well, gave an amazing speech in which he articulated how important this project of accountability is for his entire war effort. So it's not just a defensive um, stance that he's in, but he's also in this much more offensive stamp in terms of a stance in terms of using law to reinforce the norms, but also he hopes, I think, to invoke some kind of deterrence, if not for Putin himself, who may be beyond sort of rational processes of deterrence, but for those mid or low level individuals who might want to think twice about whether they want to be affiliated with a campaign of, of war crimes and other atrocities. Thank you so much. And could you also comment? So right now, what is the status of this US State Department, US government's investigation and even I'm not sure if the word prosecution is relevant yet efforts related to war crimes um, in Ukraine. Yeah, so we have been either engaged in or funding a number of different lines of effort. So our Human Rights Bureau has funded a number of civil society organizations, including the recent Nobel Prize 
winning organization, the Center for Civil Liberties, to do documentation work to a criminal law standard. So we've often had documentation being done by human rights organizations, but they're not often looking to, will this eventually be admissible in a court of law? So there may be issues with the chain of custody, for example, or with the way in which a statement was taken from a, a witness. So we've now become more sensitized to that issue, and human rights groups are undergoing training and learning essentially what the standards of admissibility would be in a hypothetical court, because we don't know what court might ultimately have jurisdiction. So what is the basic minimum standard that a court would require for something to be admissible? So that's one line of effort. We have been funding this project with the Prosecutor General, which has involved recruiting experts from the world's war crimes tribunals, including the Tribunal for the Former Yugoslavia, which inspired the establishment of my office. We now have a cadre of experts in international criminal law. That is a profession. You are an international criminal lawyer. And we have been de deploying those individuals into Ukraine to be in Kiev, working with the Prosecutor General on big ticket sort of strategic issues, but then also going out into the field, even immediately after incidents have happened, in order to essentially map out a crime scene and ensure that evidence is being collected in a way that will make it most likely to be admissible in the future. So that's the second line of effort. Then in our own courts, Congress, right at the end of last term, um, amended our War Crimes Act. This is a project that I have been advocating for for, I mean, years. Like, literally, my entire career, I have been trying to get this statute amended. And the war in Ukraine finally sort of focused Congress's attention in a very bipartisan way. There was an enormous consensus around this. And so we now have a statute on our books that enables us to prosecute in U.S. courts individuals who stand accused of committing war crimes, regardless of their nationality or the nationality of the accused. So this new war cat, the War Crimes Accountability Team, is singularly focused on that statute and what it now enables them to do. So they have opened a number of investigations involving potential crimes. On a realistic basis, they will probably have some nexus still to the United States. But if in the future some Russian suspect arrives here either under false pretenses or a false identity or their name is not on some kind of a watch list and so they manage to slip through, um, we will have the tools available in order to open a prosecution. So those investigations are, are ongoing. Can I ask, yeah. can we ask a question too? So uh, I don't know if you're uh, at liberty to answer this, but there's been some news reporting about uh, uh, conflict about what, to, to what extent we can cooperate with the ICC in supporting the ICC's uh, investigation of yeah. war crimes in Ukraine. Uh, can you? Is that something you can speak about? Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. I can't talk about internal deliberations, right. obviously, but there are essentially now three lines of effort when it comes to um, justice. One is the prosecutor general himself that's been replaced. Uh, um, there's a new individual there, Andre Kostin, who's terrific. Um, he has he's in the front line of justice. Ninety five percent of the cases I think are going to go forward in Ukrainian courts. There's also the possibility of court of cases in third courts. So that's a second, third state courts. That's a second pathway to justice. And the Europeans, for example, have opened a number of investigations. They've created a joint investigative team, which basically allows prosecutors from different national systems to speak to each other and to share information relatively frictionless. Normally, you would do this through a mutual legal assistance treaty, and that can take quite some time because it has to go through the various state departments, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and to various courts. This enables them to just talk directly to each other. So that's a second pathway to justice. The third is the ICC, as you asked about. Neither Ukraine nor Russia is a party to the Rome Statute, which created the ICC. Neither are we. Um, Ukraine has, however, now twice consented to the exercise of jurisdiction. So the first time it did was around the Maidan protests back when um, Ukraine was starting to sort of shift itself towards a more European orientation. The then leader was trying to pull back the other direction. There was violence against um, peaceful protesters. And so Ukraine's, the new, the new administration itself basically consented um, to the ICC and said, we are not gonna join the statute, but we're gonna allow you to come and investigate. Then later, as things started to ramp up, they expanded that and basically gave open-ended temporal jurisdiction. So that investigation is ongoing. There was actually reporting, I think, yesterday about where the prosecutor at the ICC may be headed. It seems, according to this reporting, if it's accurate, that he's focused on two main 
crime bases. One would be attacks on children and the abduction of children or the retention of children, even those children that may have been voluntarily sent to Russia for their safety, then not being allowed to return if they have guardians who want them back or who want to even just be in touch with them. The allegation is that that has been rejected. That could be charged as a war crime, the forcible transfer of the civilian population, or potentially of a crime against humanity, which involves a widespread or a systematic attack against a civilian population. Um, the second crime base that, if this article is correct, the prosecutor appears to be looking at, which I imagine makes sense, would be these attacks on critical elements of the civilian infrastructure. We have seen, for example, train stations that are full of individuals fleeing the violence, being deliberately attacked maternity hospitals that are very clearly not military objectives being either deliberately attacked or attacked using disproportionate force. We have seen attacks on energy infrastructure, on grain shipments that are being taken out of the country in order to deal with the food insecurity globally caused by Russia's invasion. And so these are the second set of crimes. The U.S. is not a party to the ICC, but we have in the past provided various forms of assistance, including multilateral support, um, information sharing, the, the capture essentially and transfer of two fugitives who came into U.S. custody in Central Africa, one being Bosco Udaganda, who showed up at the U.S. Embassy in Kigali, um, Rwanda. I was um, in Washington at the time, get the call at 4 a.m., you need to come into the Situation Room, there's a situation. And sure enough, you know, the, this, as the story goes, he showed up and the Marine who was there guarding the premises was like, yeah, yeah, buddy. Uh, get on with it, you know, whatever. He's like, no, no, I'm Bosco to God. I want to turn myself into the ICC. Yeah, whatever, whatever, go away. <laughs> and then it went back to business. And then, like, three hours later, this fellow came back, and the Marine was like, all right, maybe I better look him up. And, like, looks him up on the website and is like, oh, yeah, come on in. <laughs> and then we were like, what do we do with this guy? We're not parties. We have no cooperation obligations. We don't really have the ability to, like, render him to The Hague, and so five days of kind of chaotic discussions ensued with the ICC, with the Rwandan officials, and others to figure out like how to physically get this guy to The Hague. Ultimately, it was done. He's now um, serving a sentence for war crimes and crimes against humanity. The second was Dominic Anguin, a member of the Lord Resistance Army. So we're in a little bit of a different posture vis a vis Ukraine because Russia is also a non party state. And so the question is. Should we be helping on a, a matter that involves a non-party state when we're also a non-party state? And we have had objections in the past to the exercise of jurisdiction over U.S. personnel in connection with allegations involving Afghanistan, which is a member state. And so I think there's concern that we could be creating some sort of a precedent that might come back to haunt us. And so that's where the policy discussion is at present. Ambassador Von Scott, yeah. I was going to ask, you mentioned the attacks on civilian infrastructure. Yes. Um, and I thought it might be a great way for us, uh, with my students here and all and others, yeah. just to understand like, what's the nature of a war crime. Yeah. So in that case, I mean, I've read reports where the Russians argue, have argued that the attacks on the infrastructure are not war crimes mm -hmm. because the power grid is being used by right. the Ukrainian military right. um, as well. And so the attacks depleting the energy supply, in effect, will affect the military kind of readiness and therefore it's within the realm of acceptability. I'm wondering if you could respond to that idea in the course of it, just sort of share with us why would attacks on civilian infrastructure be considered a war crime? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So there's, the, the idea of war crimes trace their provenance to, you know, as long as there have been humans fighting each other, there have been rules that have governed these fighting. It has often been a part of custom, basically. There were not written documents necessarily that governed this, but there was this idea that you were not supposed to use weapons that cause unnecessary suffering, for example. That's one of the oldest um, rules of war. Likewise, civilians are supposed to be immune from direct attack. Um, you do have the, the sort of doctrine of collateral effects, right, where you are attacking a proper military objective and there happen to be civilians in the vicinity that may not be a violation of IHL, the international humanitarian law, so long as proportional force was used and that was, in fact, a lawful military objective. These sort of old customary rules over the years gradually got codified into a number of multilateral treaties. So this, and they generally happen in the immediate aftermath of a war, when you realize that the rules you were dealing with were insufficient, or they were breached, or they weren't articulated with enough strength. And so the international community inevitably comes together, creates a new treaty, goes out for signature, and you've got a new baseline. And then the next war happens, and depredations happen, and then there's a the need to go back and reinforce and draft new treaties. And so there's this sort of cycle that happens where the law always seems to be chasing after the reality of, of war on the ground. 
Um, after World War II, the international community came together and drafted the Geneva Conventions. And so when we think about war crimes, we generally think about two categories of offenses. The first are contained within the Geneva Conventions, and these are attacks against individuals who are outside of combat or to combat. So civilians immediately come to mind, the injured, the shipwrecked, and prisoners of war. These are generally custodial abuses, and you mentioned some of them in your opening, where we've seen as Ares become liberated from Russian control or where the fighting retreats, you know, people, bodies found with their hands tied behind their back, killed execution style. Um, credible reports of basements being used as rape centers. Um, you know, people being targeted as they're just riding their bikes by. They get interrogated and then they get shot in the head. Um, these are so-called Geneva-type offenses. The second category are contained in a group of treaties emer that emerged after World War I, which is the Hague Convention treaties. Um, these were more in the nature of means and methods of warfare, like the unnecessary suffering, like principles of proportionality. And so the primary rule is one of distinction. You can only address military um, force towards military objectives. Well, how do we define military objectives? It's a very complicated definition, but the sense of it is it's anything that through its use, location, um, nature, et cetera, can be used for a military advantage. And it's neutralization or destruction or capture would give the other side a benefit. So things like weapons caches, right, or a tank, those are the easy cases. The tougher cases are these so-called dual-use um, elements, like a, a bridge, for example, that might be used to transport troops, but it also could be used on a daily basis by the civilian community in order to get to work every day. And so when are you allowed to attack those sort of items? Um, there is a little bit of, um, I don't know if it's controversy, but some military lawyers will say there's no such thing as a dual use. If it is being used for military purposes, that ipso facto renders it a proper military objectives, objective that can be deliberately targeted. Others who take more of a humanitarian ICRC approach will say, well, you also have to consider civilian use, and you have to balance the military advantage to be gained with potential civilian uses. And there's a third rule that it governs, which is whatever you do, you have to do it in a way that minimizes civilian casualties. So if you have, for example, a school, let's say, where um, Ukrainian fighters are billeted or they're using that as, as a defensive posture, when you have total war, generally many buildings end up getting used, even if they were normally part of the civilian infrastructure. Then the question is, well, when do you target that? Do you target it during the day when there might be children present, or do you wait until the middle of the night and you target it when it's unlikely that civilians would be there? So these are all the kinds of rules that uh, are applying. And these war crimes are much harder to prosecute precisely because there's often a balancing test involved in terms of the amount and degree of force, what type of weapon system is used, what kind of destruction, is it destroying this thing for all times or just neutralizing its ability to be used in this conflict situation. So it'll be very interesting to see if the prosecutor moves forward, the abduction of children is at some level so much easier to, pr to prove, um, unless Russia's arguments about their humanitarian purposes can be substantiated, um, those are very easy. All of these attacks on something that could arguably be a dual use or maybe had been commandeered by the Ukrainian army, that would be for a defendant to put evidence into the record to show that, well, it looked like a maternity hospital, but in fact, it was being used for military purposes. We have not seen that. Many investigations have been done on many of these buildings that have been targeted in places like Mariupol and Kherson and elsewhere, and there's no evidence of any military objectives even in the vicinity. In fact, one of the, I forget which one, but one of the, um, maybe it was CNN, had done a map of one of the cities where they showed the obvious military objectives, and then they showed where the attacks happened, and there was like no overlap in that Venn diagram. I mean, none of the attacks were happening out where the military objectives were, and they were all in the town center where civilians were congregating. So that's a basic, quick, and dirty definition. I don't know if you want to add. Let me add yeah, just please. a couple of, couple of wrinkles. So, um, we know that the guy who was uh, the general who was in charge of the Russian, um, you know, war effort for a while, he no longer is, was also a person who was in charge of the Russian war effort in Syria. Mm -hmm. And they were sort of following a similar pattern in Ukraine, what they were doing in Syria, which is destroy everything indiscriminately, right? Which clearly is not allowed. That's a war crime, right? Uh, now, um, th there are hard cases, right? Uh, the you know, uh, uh, Ambassador Vince Scott referred to a maternity hospital. There was at least 
Some were pointing about attacks on the you know, maternity hospital where the Russians were saying, well, we had evidence that they were actually using that as a you know, military facility for launching attacks at us, right? So I, I don't know about what kind of information they had, but, but if they do have you know, legitimate intelligence information saying this is being used as a base of attacks against us, even though maternity hospitals are generally off limits, that makes it a harder case, right? Um, so there are, there are certainly a bunch of uh, cases you can come up with that if you get into prosecuting it, it becomes pretty fuzzy. But I think there are also lots and lots of cases where there's pretty compelling evidence of war crimes, and then that gets back to a jurisdictional question of what's the right court for prosecuting these, which is itself uh, difficult. Um, David, if I may also ask you a question. Please. So we were talking just a little bit before. One of the reasons Ambassador Vince Scott is here is for meetings with uh, tech companies to talk about documentation of uh, crimes. And I don't know, I think that would be of interest if you're allowed to yeah. say anything about that. Yeah, for sure. We, we saw this first really in the Syrian conflict, which you invoked. That was the first conflict that happened in an environment and a community with very high penetration of smartphones. So you have terabytes and terabytes of digital information that have come out of that conflict of just ordinary people holding up their phone and recording events around them and then trying to upload that somewhere in the hope that some prosecutor somewhere might be able to someday use that information. And so we've gone from a situation where it was often quite difficult to find evidence. Um, you had to rely very often on eyewitness accounts and survivor accounts, which have all of the challenges of re-traumatization and memory, et cetera, associated with them, with now a situation where we have so much evidence that it's sort of like finding a needle in a stack of needles. And so how do we sift through all of this digital evidence and figure out what is evidence of an actual war crime, what might be used, and what might be admissible because often what would be done in the old days, um, and, and this happened in Syria, is people would doctor the, um, the video that they were taking. Not so much because they're trying to change the content of it. It's not a deep fake issue. But they would cut out boring bits, or they would add an arrow, or they would put labeling on it. And the minute you do that, it means it's no longer in its purest form. So there's been a, an effort afoot, um, this one project called Eyewitness to Atrocities, to actually create a little app. That, that people who are under attack or in communities where there's violence happening, even if it's you know, war or otherwise, um, put it on their phones, record events around you, the metadata gets locked down, and then that information, as soon as you're in a Wi-Fi enabled environment, would immediately be uploaded into an evidence vault, where it would stay and could be analyzed by lawyers for its potential evidentiary value. So in Syria, that there was no, there wasn't enough uptake of that app. It hasn't been used very much, but it's actually now being used in Ukraine, in part organized by the International Bar Association, which sponsored this the development of this technology and is pushing it out through the Ukrainian Bar Association and other partnerships. So we now have a, a, a set of circumstances where evidence can be immediately collected. It cannot be tampered with or changed. Everything gets a unique hashtag. And so if you go in there and start changing anything, it will immediately be, everyone would be alerted to that fact. And so you can trust it for what it, it, it depicts what it purports to depict. Now, you still have to do all the analysis to see whether or not it actually shows who's responsible. There's often a tendency to sort of focus your phone on the victim, when what you probably should be doing is focusing your phone on the arc of where that missile came from and trying to figure out you know, who controlled that piece of territory over there, which was the origin of a particular missile. So a lot of training is being done in civil society and, and sort of ordinary communities to teach people how to be better documentarians on the theory that if you're going to do this, if you're going to take the risk of standing up there with your cell phone, you should make, we should make sure that there's a maximum utility for what you're doing. Um, and a lot of people are just naturally drawn to doing this work, and so they're, they're going to be out there, and so let's make sure they're doing it well. The other concern has been um, tech platforms like Facebook or otherwise who discover evidence of war crimes on their platforms and take it down because it violates their terms of service or it violates their community standards. And then the question is, what do you do with that information? And so Berkeley and others have gotten together and are trying to create this idea of a vault that tech companies could 
refer the information to, so they don't have to hold it, they can take it off their platforms, but at least it's safe and then it can be evaluated for its evidentiary value. Um, there were several prosecutions in Europe involving Syrian perpetrators that relied upon evidence from their own social media platform, their own social media accounts, trophy videos, essentially, that they were taking of their activities within the conflict. And so being able to save that material and then use it against perpetrators, you know, when the time comes and they're in custody, could be incredibly valuable. So this is the brave new world we're in, where evidence is increasingly digital, it's enormous, the volumes are incredible, and we need now smart people coming out of smart programs to think about how technology can be harnessed to find the best evidence and make sure it's preserved and in the hands of the prosecutors. Ambassador Von Scott, you mentioned before um, sexual violence. And I know you've yeah. written powerfully in your academic work on sexual violence as a war crime. Could you comment more on what you're seeing in Ukraine now about sexual violence yeah. as a potential war crime? Yeah, it is one of these per se war crimes, right? There's no argument that you you know can't you can engage can engage in this type of behavior. It's it's been a war crime as in time immemorable. And yet we see it in almost every conflict situation. Not every conflict situation, but most many conflict situations, you see this happening. It's a really disturbing um, component of any conflict situation. We now have developed very strong jurisprudence, presidential jurisprudence, that it's a war crime and also potentially a crime against humanity or even a crime, a, a predicate act of genocide. And so collecting and preserving that is important. Now, we know also that this can be incredibly difficult. There's still a lot of stigma associated with survivors who don't want to talk about it because they don't want their communities to know what they have experienced. Um, they don't want to relive the situation. It's extremely difficult. We had a very um, unfortunate situation during the Yugoslavia war where journalists were running around literally asking, has anyone here been raped? because they wanted to be able to tell that story from a first-hand perspective. And then survivors would be interviewed over and over again by multiple journalists, by human rights organizations, by investigators. And so um, Nadia Murad, who's the Nobel Peace Prize winner, has created the Murad Code. And one of the key precepts is um, do no harm, right? Don't continue to um, ask individuals to provide statements. If you're an NGO or a journalist, you are maybe doing a screening interview, but then you do not ask to take that person's full statement. You make an appropriate referral to a law enforcement element, or you just say, listen, can I keep your contact information? And would you mind if I referred you to a prosecutor or an investigator when the time comes? And so keeping the agency within the survivor to be able to decide when and under what circumstances they do want to tell their story. And so we're seeing that a lot better now out into the field that the data collection is, is being done in a much more sensitive way. And what we're hearing is really um, incredibly disturbing, where Russia's forces come into a village, um, and often, to the extent that there are men there, most of the more the older, you know, mid-level, mid-aged men are on the field because there's been a, a conscription um, event, and so you're left with some of the older men and the younger boys. Um, and then the women are subjected to various forms of sexual violence, including kind of a sexual slavery type situation in basement um, and other areas where they're billeted. And so um, it's, it's disturbing to see not only that it's happening, but that it's happening on the scale that it's happening, and that there's sort of like patterns to it, which then starts to give rise to allegations of crimes against humanity, which require not only a widespread or systematic attack against a civilian population, but some evidence that it's being done pursuant to a policy, even a policy of neglect and of omission, that, that commanders are failing to appropriately supervise their subordinates, um, and in fact, maybe giving a, a tacit or an overt kind of a green light for this to happen. So it's a terrible um, component of this of this crisis, and we're only going to hear more of it, I think, as, as areas become liberated. Thank you. I wanted to ask also a question that's come up at the Ethics Center a bit um, about aggression. Mm -hmm. And if I recall correctly, at Nuremberg, mm -hmm. uh, a number of Nazi leaders were convicted of the crime of aggression. Certainly the, the invasion of Ukraine is sort of one of the most brazen border crossings we've seen in a really long time. Is it possible, I'll pose this to you, Ambassador Vanskak, and to you, Professor um, Sluss, is it possible that anyone could be convicted of the crime of aggression in this matter? Yeah, you're absolutely right that at Nuremberg and then the, the sister tribunal in Tokyo, the Tokyo Tribunal, both had jurisdiction over war crimes, which at the time were very well established, although much of it was part of customary law. There were some treaties that were applicable. Um, 
Crimes Against Humanity, which was an innovation at the time. There wasn't that. That name had been used around the you know, persecution of the Armenian population in World War I, et cetera, but there wasn't a concept necessarily, and so that concept became developed in the Nuremberg Charter and then was prosecuted at Nuremberg. Um, and then Crimes Against the Peace, which was the lexicon of the era, which was essentially the war of, an, of aggression in the first place, from which all of the crimes against humanity and war crimes subsequently flowed. Um, and that was really the centerpiece, in some respects, of the Nuremberg proceedings. This was supposed to be the trial to end all war, um, although the crimes against humanity ended up being a stronger legacy because it's now become prosecutable in many domestic courts around the world. All of the war crimes tribunals that have been established have jurisdiction over crimes against humanity, but not crimes against the peace. It was never codified. Um, it kind of There was some talk about it, and then it kind of fell away when the ICC effort was reinvigorated in the, in the early 90s and mid-90s, in part inspired by the establishment of the ad hoc tribunals, there was talk about putting the crime of aggression, as it was now called, into the ICC statute. Somewhat controversial. I was sort of opposed to it, honestly, um, in my academic writing, because I wanted the court to be focused on crimes against human beings and not crimes against sovereignty. And I was concerned that adding what could be a very politicized crime within, within the ICC's jurisdiction would detract from or would further politicize, the work is already somewhat politicized, further politicize the work of the court that I wanted to be focused on as um, crimes against human communities and civilians, et cetera. What they did at the early stage of creating the Rome Statute was put a placeholder in. The negotiations were very fraught. They couldn't agree on a definition of aggression. They couldn't agree on a jurisdictional regime. And so they sort of punted. And they said, all right, we'll put a placeholder in. And they will hold a review conference several years hence in which we'll come back to that. And so in that interim period, states got together. They negotiated the crime. They negotiated the, um, the jurisdictional regime. The U.S., frankly, was not involved in those discussions at all. At this point, it was the Bush administration. They were very anti the ICC, at least in the first term, and so didn't allow a U.S. observer mission to participate in those negotiations. And as a result, they went forward without any input from the United States. The Obama administration changed tact and um, ultimately started sending an observer delegation that was participating in those um, negotiations. But a lot of the text had been kind of finalized at that point. The review conference happened in 2010 in Kampala, so we talk about the Kampala Amendments, and the crime of aggression, a definition, was inserted within the Rome Statute and then a jurisdictional regime. The regime is somewhat different than the ICC's generic um, background jurisdictional regime, which is so long as the state of nationality of the accused or the state on whose territory crimes were committed have ratified the Rome Statute, then jurisdiction exists. So that's why Ukraine can say, we give you jurisdiction, and so that gives jurisdiction over Russian offense offenders, even though Russia has not ratified the treaty. Aggression was different. Aggression, basically both sides of a war situation, would have to have ratified the, uh, the new amendments in order to have jurisdiction. So the ICC itself has no jurisdiction. This has created what has been described as a gap in the system, that if we think of Russian aggression as being the sort of original sin from which all of the other atrocities have flowed, then wouldn't it make sense to prosecute that crime of aggression in the Nuremberg tradition? And so Ukraine, from almost the beginning, was asking the international community to create some sort of an ad hoc tribunal that would have um, maybe exclusive jurisdiction over the crime of aggression. Those conversations are ongoing. There's a core group of states that are really interested in this, and the U.S. is participating as a member of that, you know, in, in those negotiations with the core group. Um, and a number of different models have been put forward. One would be a kind of Ukrainian court, special chambers, with a lot of international support. So international states could second judges, um, lawyers, et cetera. This is a hybrid model that we've seen in other situations like Sierra Leone or Cambodia. At the other end of the spectrum, the idea would be some sort of a multilateral body that would be created with some sort of a blessing by the General Assembly, maybe by virtue of a bilateral treaty between Ukraine and the United Nations. Russia would not be able to veto that effort if it goes through the General Assembly versus going through the Security Council. So that's another model. And that's what's being debated now in this core group. Yeah, so the, actually, let me, let me uh, more directly answer the question that you asked, which is, do you think anybody's actually going uh, yes. to get prosecuted yes, for the time of Yes, that is a practical question. <laughs> uh, I actually think there's a decent chance this will happen. 
right? Uh, I don't think it's going to happen tomorrow. I don't think it's going to happen this year. Uh, but, you know, it's worth remembering. I mean, I think, uh, you know, what Ambassador Vince Scott, if you sort of followed her track through there, notice there has not been anybody prosecuted for the crime of aggression since yeah. Nuremberg, yeah. right? So it's been a long time since this has happened. Uh, and there have been a lot of obstacles along the way, but the, the kinds of modalities that she was describing about setting up an ad hoc tribunal, all of these different proposals for setting up an ad hoc tribunal have their own problems. Uh, but, you know, the war is going to end at some point, right? We don't know when it's going to end. And when, it, when the war ends, I think there's actually a decent chance that some of the high-level Russians who were responsible for launching what very clearly is a war of aggression, uh, I think some of them will end up being held accountable, not through the International Criminal Court, that's not really a viable option, but through some other sort of ad hoc tribunal that, uh, as she was saying, still sort of the, the modalities of that are still being negotiated, and I'm not quite sure what that's going to look like. I think the General Assembly will end up playing a role here uh, in some form as well, yeah. So uh, that's my prediction, but we'll have to wait and see. Uh, and, it's, and, and I don't think it will happen until we actually see an end to the war. Uh, and, and that end of the war may not be coming, unfortunately, anytime soon. I mean, wish, wish I could say it's ending, you know, yeah. soon, but, uh, but that's not looking likely at this point. Just a, a uh, one quick clarifying thing. It's often a question that I get asked. There isn't an international police force that can cross a border into Russia, abduct people, and bring them back and put them on trial. So they would have to either leave of their own accord or have been tossed out as, you know, some sort of political transformation that happens. People think about Interpol, the international police, and think, well, why can't Interpol do something? Well, all Interpol really can do is circulate what is a uh, arrest warrant produced by one legal jurisdictional regime, like a single state or the ICC, throughout its member states, so that everybody knows that this person is wanted and wanted by a particular court. But it has no power to actually bring those individuals into custody. So, so long as Russian um, perpetrators remain within Russia, and so long as there's no sort of political transformation, then it's going to be very hard to have custody. That said, as David said, we are all playing a long game in this world, and I don't think Slobodan Milosevic ever thought he would see the inside of a courtroom, or he sent Habre of Chad, um, and both of them did subsequently. Um, and so, again, it's a, it's a matter of time, um, and setting up the, A, doing the documentation to preserve the potential evidence, and B, having the institutions available to do the, to, to do the prosecutions. Well, a follow-up question to that for both of you again, um, and this comes from the Ethics Center and in the audience as well. A lot of sensitivity out there um, throughout the world related to the United States um, occupation and invasion of Iraq, and that setting a precedent, making it perhaps very difficult, complicated to talk about human rights, given, I'll say, given the, especially the just the excessive civilian deaths in the context of the war in Iraq. How does that challenge your work, Ambassador Renskog? And Professor Sloss, if you could comment also on the challenges you think that poses to doing uh, war crimes work now. Yeah, it, it's definitely a complicating factor. There's a lot of sort of whataboutism that happens, and um, you know, states that are resistant to some of these lines of effort will say, well, who are you to be championing justice when you know, this, that, or the other thing happened? Um, and I think it's, it's important to stay focused on the facts of this particular case, which is, as you said, a kind of manifest violation of the UN Charter, all of the principles undergirding the Charter, it, not only to the territorial integrity and sovereignty, but also just the right of people to live in a situation of peace um, and dignity, um, to, have to chart their own life path. Um, all of that has been indelibly breached, and not just breached in a sort of a pure sense, but then breached through the commission of widespread and systematic violations against civilians. And so it's an extreme case that, that really calls out for, I think, a, a global response. And that's partly what Ukraine is trying to organize as a global response. There has been some you know, grumbling maybe from some states that have said, where were you? Where were you when there was essentially a regional war in Central Africa? Where were you when there was an internal armed conflict and war crimes were happening, you know, on all parts and, you know, various powers were supporting various armed actors in those conflicts? There's a lot of that is happening, and I think it's a lot of it's a, a messaging challenge 
to convey that this is about the rules-based order, this is about the right of, of sovereign states to have their borders be respected by their neighbors, including their very powerful neighbors who could easily run roughshod over them. This is about people being able to live in peace and to chart their own life paths. And so broadening the tent so that states, even states that might be upset about selective justice and you know the, the disproportionate response of the international community, see that they have a stake in how the international community responds to the war in Ukraine. Yeah. So um, when, uh, when Russia invaded uh, last year, uh, you saw a lot of commentary about uh, well, the U.S. is in no position to criticize because the U.S. has violated international law, too. Uh, and a lot of references back to Iraq. Uh, and it's true, the only thing that, uh, in my opinion, violated international law when, uh, when we invaded Iraq in 2003. Uh, at the same time, I think there are dramatic differences between the two cases. And uh, I actually wrote an essay that was published on the Marco Center blog uh, about a year ago, uh, a little over a year ago maybe, uh, on uh, addressing this moral equivalence argument. Right? And I think that the core idea of the UN Charter really is that you don't change international borders by use of force. You don't use force to redraw international borders. And that is exactly what Russia is trying to do in Ukraine. That was not what the United States was trying to do in Iraq. Right? We weren't trying to eliminate Iraq as a sovereign state. Now, that doesn't mean that what we were doing there was right. I think I, had a lot, I objected to it at the time. Uh, you know, I still think it was wrong. It was a mistake. But, but I don't think the two are morally equivalent because I do think that there's something, you know, a sort of a core fundamental norm of the international system is you don't use military force to basically eliminate a sovereign state or to sort of redraw boundaries between sovereign states. And that is what Russia is trying to do here, if not what the United States was trying to do in Iraq. The other big difference between the two is, uh, and Ambassador Vince Scott referred to this, just the level of violence inflicted on civilians is really dramatically different in the two cases. You know? No doubt there were a lot of civilian deaths in Iraq, but the United States was not going out there and basically targeting civilians and trying to cause widespread civilian damage. Uh, at least from my perspective, it's hard to come up with any other explanation for what Russia is up to here. It seems that they're deliberately targeting civilians, they're de deliberately trying to cause widespread civilian harm. That, again, is a violation of sort of fundamental, both legal and moral principles. Uh, and I don't think the United States was trying to do that in Iraq. So I, I don't want to be an apologist for U.S. action in Iraq. I, uh, like I said, no, I would... whatever it is. <laughs> You're very strong. <laughs> Uh, but, I do, but I do think there's significant differences here. You know, a couple of questions um, that really follow on both of your comments here, and people noting that um, really the kind of remarkable reaction and support of Ukraine from many countries, um, as well as many not. But um, folks asking and wondering, this interpretive comment, but are, are, um, are some international precedents of a positive nature now being established given the international reaction to Ukraine? Perhaps given the fact that we're talking about war crimes in this room right now. What yeah. are your comments from both of you, please? Uh, it's a really great question. Um, and I think the answer is yes. There, there's this sort of, there's, a, there's this great Twitter thing that says me, these memes. And one of the memes was, no, no, it actually strengthens international law when it gets breached because everyone says it's been a breach. You know? <laughs> it's like, but, but the, there's actually an, uh, some underlying truth to that. The, the whole world is so outraged by what is being seen. And you've seen states come together and they're supporting justice efforts. 43 states referred the matter to the ICC. That's never been done. That's unprecedented. Um, you know, and, and to have supported it. Um, all of the money that has flowed into supporting documentation efforts and 
prosecution efforts and seconded personnel and sending forensic mobile labs and all of that going forward, I think it is strengthening the system of justice and accountability that then can be used in other situations. And also, I think, making it harder to do selective responses because we can say, listen, this is how the international community responded here. We need an equal response to this new situation that has emerged in the future at some point. And states get used to investing in justice and accountability. And I, I hope that those investments will continue and will continue to build the system out to strengthen it so that it can respond more robustly going forward. Um, we are literally building an airplane as we're flying it, I think, here, to a certain extent. I mean, the, the former Yugoslavia Tribunal did this a little bit, but they were remote and external. I mean, this is a prosecutor who's trying to prosecute war crimes in real time while his investigators and prosecutors are having to run into bunkers when an air raid siren goes. And so that's like never been done before. And if we can make it work, we can maybe capture some of the deterrent effect of the law, capture some of the expressive power of the law. And we hope, all of us, that it would cause some folks to think twice in the future if they want to launch something like this. And maybe I'll say something just a little bit about the sort of broader implications for international law and the international system here. Uh, so, uh, I wrote a co-authored piece with a woman named uh, Laura Dickinson, who's an old friend of, uh, of both of ours. Uh, and we looked at sort of a number of different markers of the international response to Ukraine. And basically divided states in the world into three categories, sort of liberal democracies, autocracies, and what political scientists refer to as hybrid states, which are somewhere in between liberal democracies and autocracies. And we looked at sort of votes in the UN, we looked at who's participating in sanctions, we looked at a couple other indicators. And what we found, not surprisingly, is that the response from liberal democracies has been dramatically different than the response from autocracies. And so um, what, uh, one of the things that we sort of argued in this piece is that uh, for a long time, I think the people who sort of want a so-called so liberal international order have uh, sort of worked off the assumption that to build an international, a liberal international order, we have to do it on a global basis. And I think what we're seeing from the response to uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine is uh, we probably can't do that on a global basis. We need to actually build a liberal international order through more cooperation among liberal democracies. And we're starting to see this happen. We're starting to see it in the response to Ukraine. We're starting to see it in other ways. This has been a theme for the Biden administration, and I think it's an important one. And so, you know, one of the takeaways from this is if we want to preserve an international order that's consistent with liberal values, we're not going to get buy-in from Russia and China and a bunch of other states. But there are a bunch of states out there we can get buy-in from, and we need to look harder at how do we sort of cooperate on a global basis among liberal democracies to preserve an international system that's consistent with liberal values. So I think we're seeing that happening, and I think that's a good thing. Earlier, Ambassador Van Scott, you mentioned uh, countries around the world saying, hey, why, why didn't you pay attention to what's happening in Central Africa and all? And just if you could, for a moment, we're focusing on Ukraine, and rightfully so. Are there places in the world that really concern you that we ought to be paying more attention to as well? Yes, I love that question. Thank you. Because I am working so hard not to let Ukraine take over my entire office and my entire portfolio and all of my energy, because there are these other areas that really cry out for attention and where I think a modest investment by the international community with expertise, with resources, you know, technical training, whatever, could make an enormous difference. So I have traveled to a number of different places. Um, the, the couple that stand out to me, one is Ethiopia. The cessation of hostilities agreement that ended the hostilities now um, since November in northern Tigray in Tigray State, Northern Ethiopia, contains a very explicit provision for a inclusive transitional justice process. And so what is that going to look like? So my deputy and a staffer of mine are, are there now or leaving today. I've lost track of when they're flying <laughs> for a consultation with Ethiopian civil society and governmental actors that are trying to think about what does transitional justice look like for Ethiopia. Likewise, the Gambia, uh, Liberia are both situations that had terrible violence um, and had a very successful truth commission process, which produced very helpful 
and uh, recommendations that have never been implemented. And so both of those are now refocusing on implementation. What does that look like? And so I've been to both places. The staffer who was going to Ethiopia started her trip in Gambia, again, meeting with members of the government to sort of encourage them. They have conceptualized a hybrid court with ECOWAS, which is a regional political body um, that would provide some of the resources, infrastructure, platform, support, personnel, then partnering with Gambian specialists um, who have done this work. The Gambia, weirdly, has more international criminal lawyers than any other small state that one can think of. There's just former chief prosecutor of the ICCs from Gambia, former judges, for, you know, a number of them. And so it's interesting to see how sophisticated their approach is, and they're really benefiting from the fact that many of their senior personnel had worked out in international institutions and now are bringing that home. That's a place I think that's worth keeping an eye on. Central African Republic has a, a hybrid, also a hybrid court, the um, Special Criminal Court, that is adjudicating crimes emerging from there, kind of serial conflict situations um, under very difficult circumstances, even now security-wise, and yet they're hitting important milestones. And so we shouldn't lose sight of that. Colombia, out leaving Africa, Colombia is engaged in a very complicated and sophisticated transitional justice process that has an interesting mix of truth-telling, of reparation, of accountability, of even a kind of an amnesty, but a conditional amnesty, an amnesty that comes with obligations of the person who enjoys an amnesty to give back to the community and to, um, to, to rebuild the body politic, and then guarantees of non-repetition. Um, in Asia, the extraordinary criminal chambers for the courts of Cambodia have just shut down. They were prosecuting the surviving members of the Khmer Rouge. They're now in a kind of a legacy phase, so it's important to think about what to do with the archives, how to deal with issues of witness protection. If witnesses might, down the line, get um, intimidated, these are very elderly um, defendants, and so what do you do if their health fails? How do you deal with humanitarian responses, early release, et cetera? So these are all the places where justice is happening, but they have been overshadowed by what's happening in Ukraine. So I'm trying to make sure my office stays focused so that if there's a role for the U.S., either through funding or diplomatic support or just um, technical expertise, that we can be playing that role. One final question. Yeah. Um, you know, I think we're all familiar with prosecutors seeing the dark side of humanity, yeah. but it strikes me, and I'm sure many of us, that you see this darkness really in a very extensive way. What gives you hope in your work? Yeah, yeah, it's it's definitely a, a difficult job. I mean, I'm often hovering at a policy level, so I'm not necessarily you know meshed in the facts. But then I go out into the field and I speak with survivors and I get the facts firsthand. Um, I'm recently back from Bangladesh, which is another area that I think deserves attention. There's a million, almost a million Rohingya refugees that have either been, you know, chased across a border or fled across an international border because they were being deliberately targeted in what the United States has described as a genocide against them. Um, hearing ordinary Rohingya refugees asking me questions about where the ICC is on their investigation is kind of amazing. I mean, these, they don't have a written language, and yet they are aware that the ICC has taken their case and is looking at their case. Um, hearing about their projects around justice, how they're teaching their children about what their rights are. I met with a group of women who, um, some Rohingya communities are very conservative, women don't operate outside of the home necessarily. These women have become leaders in their refugee communities and they're trying to articulate what justice means for those people um, and then feed that into justice processes that are happening, not just at the ICC, but the International Court of Justice has um, taken jurisdiction over a, a claim by the Gambia, actually, stepping forward under the Genocide Convention to accuse Myanmar of committing genocide. Gambia's in West Africa, and yet they're accusing Myanmar. <coughs> it's fascinating to see the state stepping up and to try and um, to preserve and to enforce the norms that we all hold so dear. Um, and then, of course, around the world, Argentina has opened an investigation. So I was down in Buenos Aires meeting with prosecutors and judges who were bringing cases. There may not be a, ever a member of the Tabodal military that travels to Buenos Aires, but they've got an investigation opened, which means they can issue an arrest warrant, which means they can give that arrest warrant to Interpol, which means Interpol can circulate that arrest warrant, which means if one of those Tabodal members goes to Paris because they want to go shopping, that arrest warrant is potentially actionable there. So, like, then we're building this system, as David says, um, slowly but surely. And so um, we need smart, committed, dedicated people. So for the students out there, you know, consider a career in international affairs. 
consider coming to law school. Santa Clara is one of the best international law programs. You know, you see him here um, in, in full force, but there's others as well. Um, and find a way to plug into this work when we're in the other. Well, thank you. And yeah. please join me in thanking Ambassador Beth von Scott.